Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 395, The Wedding Edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Guy Nashen, and it's Wednesday, the 16th of May, 2018. Gavin, welcome back to the program. You are at the castle in France. <laughs> I, I'm I'm in the French shack, <laughs> the French shack. <laughs> yeah, which, which didn't which didn't flood. It's amazing, Kevin. This is an old uh, water mill, and it's been it's right by the side of a river that 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 swells enormously when the rain comes, oh, well, yeah. and it's surrounded by a wall that's about eighteen inches high, um, and and the water comes up. 16 inches and it doesn't come any further and it, it looks like it's going to flood but clearly it was built here because it didn't flood so um, you know it could next year but the last two years has been a huge amount of rain and my, my neighbors have sent me pictures saying you better get over here you're in real trouble <laughs> and I, you know I, 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 I did and have and um, thank you neighbors but amazingly it hasn't flooded and now it's May it's, it's dry it's wonderful I, I'm here to write and pray and um, I'm, I'm just for, for as long as we can afford the French taxes um, that may not be very much longer. <laughs> well, let me make an. Uh, I'm going to make a note. Gavin has trouble with the moat flooding. <laughs> okay, I got it. No problem. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm more worried about French yeah. I, I trust the Lord to deal with the flood more than I trust Him to deal with French penalizing <laughs> English. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. They, they want to get your taxes. Um, let's move on to some news here. I don't know if you guys have television, if you guys have the internet, if you have cable TV, you know there's going to be a wedding very soon in England. And I thought uh, you and I could talk about it because um, my, my whole news feed here from the Daily Mail is full of uh, stories about the wedding. Meghan Markle's half-sister says she's not going to tell me what to say. Uh, Meghan Markle's mother left LAX with a Burberry bag. It's what her dress is in. I, I, oh, Ma Meghan Markle's said, mother lands in UK. I mean, this is one update after another. <laughs> you guys just I'm love just your wedding stuff. Well, my, well, I feel so at home talking with you, Kevin, because it's like talking to my wife. And I've realized this because she gets her news updates from the Daily Mail too. <laughs> <laughs> Harry and Meghan's very modern wedding. Couple breaks with royal tradition. <gasps> Next story, Princess Diana will be there in spirit. You know, it's just oh, like, oh, the four possible surgeries Meghan Markle's father could have to take. <laughs> and God bless him and God help him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we do keep him in our prayers, but, you know, there's, there's very few families that make the Coulson family look normal. The Royals and the Markles make my family look very normal, and I, I appreciate you, know, you guys going out of the way. Um, what what is it like in, in London nowadays uh, when these weddings take uh, place? Well, these these are theatre. They're yeah. they're great public spectacles, and of course, the public love them, and they're they're harmless. No one is blowing anybody up. You hope, um, although I, perhaps Diana's marriage to Charles turned out not to be harmless after all. But um, they're but they're spectacles, and people love them. They they touch a, in a sort of an archetypical chord, um, and uh, it's it's an excuse for everyone to throw a party and gossip terribly, of course. But but behind the weddings, there are always some some very important principles and interestingly enough this wedding is being used by uh, by the church of england to send out some not so subtle signals <laughs> we did learn uh about three days ago that presiding bishop curry will be uh given a dress uh, at the wedding which this is a big win for the episcopal church um and, and let me be really frank about that um if god can use kevin to bring people closer to Christ, if God can use Gavin uh, to to spread the the word of Christ, uh, He can certainly you use presiding Bishop Curry. I want to get that out of the way before you know we go into uh, too much commentary here. But there's an important point here of why we're choosing Bishop Curry. Why are we choosing him? It's part of the overall Welby strategy, mm -hmm. um, which we've we've known about and described and. Uh, I, I, there's no satisfaction in seeing it unfold. I would rather have been wrong. Mm -hmm. But the strategy was step one, uh, tell everyone that nothing is going to change and nobody needs to leave the Church of England. We will continue to honor God and the Bible. 
step two, uh, roll over and appoint a whole load of people who don't believe that <laughs> uh, to high office. Uh, step three, continue the campaign um, by, by validating all those who speak out on behalf of, of gay marriage. And essentially, uh, neither Harry nor Meghan Markle uh, had any idea who George Curry was. He is, of course, a really delightful man and yes, a very absolutely. good speaker. Yeah. Gosh, I wish I could preach with his verve, uh -huh. uh, but it's what he preaches that matters. And he is, of course, um, one of the most prominent advocates for gay marriage in the world. And after all the um, the drama and the politics and the promises that the Episcopal Church will in some way be disciplined, marginalized, sidelined, separated from over their stand, uh, what Welby does when the moment comes is he invites George Curry to have one of the biggest public stages uh, that is offered to anybody now in one sense of well, course he, he's he's I, an american episcopalian I, I i need to back up a little bit you're saying george curry i think his name is michael curry michael isn't that's it a, yeah. uh, presiding <laughs> bishop that's michael curry time. that's all right <laughs> you sure it's, it's not michael george yeah, yeah. Have to give george michael no 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 <laughs> it, 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 it's an presiding it, bishop it, curry i'm very sorry that's right it's it's, <laughs> so, a, it's a good know, faux pas to have um, but I, I wanted to back up real quick here because two years ago I got on a plane and I flew from JFK all the way over the pond to Heathrow and I took a train into Canterbury. There was going to be a, a, a gathering of the primates. These primates yeah. gathered for a week and they came to the last day and they said, listen, um, we've all agreed it's time to censure the Episcopal Church for a period of three years. They will serve no leadership role. They will have no voting role. And basically, they can't call themselves Anglican. So is this, in a way, an ecumenical service because they're not Anglican? Or I, I, I'm I really not getting my head around what's happening here. Well, Kevin, as you know very well, and you and George have pointed out, um, Justin Welby never delivered on any of those promises. No. Uh, they were they were broken promises and and i'm sorry to say it but, but essentially an example of very serious hypocrisy doing one thing in public and another thing behind the scenes and now the cloak of secrecy or the cloak of doing two things has dropped entirely um and presiding bishop curry has been invited and and he'll do very well it's just such a shame mm -hmm. that he that he that he presents a, a version of christianity uh, that betrays what Jesus came to do. And I think it's important to say that when we talk about people who stand for this sub-Christianity, it's very important we shouldn't be rude about them or critical of them personally. Yep. It's a very difficult thing to do, to make a distinction, because I think we're going to talk about some of the the appointments that Welby has made in the, the Church of England later on. And and these are, are, are I'm sure, good and honorable people, but they, they've got a vision of the gospel that is simply not the one that's given in scripture and this matters immensely because because in the end one of the reasons why uh, orthodox christians from athanasius onwards have fought for the truth is that if you're not in the truth of jesus you don't get the transformation and the holiness you 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 get a you get religion and the, what we're getting today is a kind of therapeutic religion where God pats you on the head and says you can be and do whatever you want if it pleases you and the problem with presiding Bishop Curry's Christianity as it is with uh, with the, the new women bishops that are being appointed in England is it's it's a sub Christianity that won't set people free and in the end if we use biblical language appears to be an abomination to God so we're not criticizing the people themselves I I spent years thinking that too and I had to repent I, I'm sympathetic but equally we have to speak out as clearly as we can to try and show the difference between um, how God has revealed himself and what he wants to do with people and a perversion of it the perversion being this different kind of Christianity and, and it matters very much that Archbishop Welby has given presiding Bishop Curry this public platform because what it will do is to uh, expand the credentials of tech and everything tech stands for and be a really serious impetus in moving the Church of England further in that direction as we always said he intended. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my biggest qualm in this is, you know, Harry and Meghan didn't know anything about this. Who? 
No, they, never, they, no, they have no idea who he is. <laughs> um, I just think, well, whatever. All right, so um, there was a story about a person uh, who, he's a lord, uh, decides I can't go to my church anymore because the, the dean is gay. And I, I just have a lot of trouble with this. He writes about it, it gets published, and there's some backlash, but there's some brutal honesty there. Yes, Lord Lord Tebbit uh, is an old street fighter as mm -hmm. a politician. Uh, he's on he's on the right of politics. Uh, he's always been very honest. He was he was blown up by the IRA, and um, uh, he and his wife were very badly injured. Um, he has just he goes to a local Anglican cathedral, where he, which he, he gives generously to support, and they've just appointed a new dean, and the new dean is gay, and he's going with his male partner. Um, one of the things, again, we've been saying over the years is that slowly and quietly and surreptitiously but deliberately, uh, the deans of, of the cathedrals have been increasingly appointed. They've been appointing as, as deans uh, gay men with their live-in partners. Uh, and so Lord Tebbit, having discovered this, said, well, this is simply wrong this isn't christianity and i'm not going to go on supporting it now the interesting thing is he's been criticized for being homophobic and being unreasonable and, and being old-fashioned uh but, but but a conservative gay mp said lord tebbit may be shocked at how many other partnered gay deans there are in other cathedrals and and he's exactly right uh, they have been being a, being appointed there in the last 10 years uh, one after the other after the other after the other after the other it's been part of the way in which the homosexualization of the church of england and its hierarchy has been taking place it's part of the it's part of the plan and the strategy and once again the problem is that the faithful don't know about it every so often someone like lord tebbit says wait a moment this is not christianity this is not the bible this is not what god calls us to and people say well too bad that's what the church of england is doing <laughs> well and i mean for an experiment for anybody in our audience uh, it would help if you lived in england if you want to uh, send an email to the the, the press at church house um, i'll put the email address right here if you want to contact them ask them hey uh, offhand how many gay partner deans are there uh, in the Church of England um, I, I bet you will not get a numbered response you'll get uh, oh we don't really keep that type of information here it's really that's a personal uh, uh, thing it's not part of the Church of England uh, you could ask the cathedrals yourself if you want you know, that type of thing um, you'd be surprised the, the type of information you cannot get out of the Church of England did you go I bet you went. you probably got an invitation to this big gala that happened last weekend in London. They have a new bishop now. You got your invitation, right? Yes. No, I, I, I wasn't invited. <laughs> you know, I if you're going to be a journalist for Anglican TV, you need to be on the invite <laughs> list for these things. Okay. Um, I don't know. It's probably my ancestry, um, but when I say this name, I often butcher it, and it's with uh, great apologies. Uh, bishop Malali. Is that right? Mulali. Mulali. I'm sorry. It's, Sarah it, Mulali. It, it's my heritage. I can't pronounce uh, names like this. Uh, has been appointed, consecrated, and is the new Bishop of London. Um, how goes that? Well, for those who wanted women bishops, they are ecstatic because she breaks the mold in very many ways. Uh, she has no theological education, so this is she, she was trained as a priest part time in her forties, and this is a sign that you can be appointed to the highest office in the Church of England without any training. This is great, Kevin. This is about op equal opportunity, and it's wonderful wow. that somebody with almost no, almost no theological training to speak of, can can be appointed to such a high office and bear such responsibility, uh, relying only on on the Lord, I guess, because because she won't have had the time. To do, I know that's. I, I mustn't be snide. No, but, don't be but snide. But I didn't point. even know this. This is just amazing. I mean, uh, the well, she. I mean, in one sense, actually, in one sense, it is good. Of course, it's good. Yeah. And in another sense, it's really, it's really terrible. Right. I mean, the good sense is that 
um, you know, I, I like the fact that institutions are blown open to mm. to the mechanisms of power. But in this, and, and so it's probably a good thing that she doesn't have a PhD from Oxford or Cambridge, because there are lots of people who can serve the Lord without having PhDs from Oxford Absolutely. or Cambridge. Absolutely. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, having some theology is quite important because what it does is give you a map of of um, of experience about. Um, and academic theology will only take you so far. What you really have to have is the Holy Spirit, but you still need the map. You do need um, the map. And Sarah right. Mullally was a was was a senior administrator and a midwife. We'll come back to the midwife thing in a moment because it's very important. Uh, and she was clearly very competent indeed. So she went to um, a, a, a public state school and she went to a polytechnic, which is a, a really bad, poor kind of university where, on the whole, not very clever people go. There was a distinction in England between proper universities and the and the kind of third-rate places. And so, and she then became a nurse and rose to the top uh, as a political nursing officer. Uh, and then in her 40s, found herself called to ministry. Uh, in my view, mistook it for priesthood. Um, and And quite early on was chosen as the kind of person that the Welby era wanted to promote because she's a manager. Okay. Um, well, 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 I want to ask some theological questions then. Um, okay. if, if she has no theological training officially, um, what would her uh, opi very, very yeah, uh, opinion be on maybe abortion? Well, as a Christian, mm -hmm. um, occupying a senior place uh, as a nursing, as a senior nursing officer, she could have used her position to save the lives of children. Uh, she has taken a very studied and ambivalent attitude, and in her blog she has said uh, there are some occasions when she might be thought of as pro-life and other occasions where she might be thought of as pro-choice. Um, she's pro-life for herself and pro-choice for others. Essentially, she's just a basic feminist who doesn't want to be caught out taking a position. But the thing about abortion and the killing of children is if you don't take a position, you're taking a position. <laughs> uh, and one of the real problems for many of us, it, it's taken me a long time to catch up with the significance of abortion. Uh, I, I was once presenting a BBC show. I had no real view. Somebody phoned in. And while they were whittering away, I Googled. And I Googled the number of abortions that have been in England from that moment to this. And, and Kevin, it was six million children. And on air, I said, Oh my heavens, six million, that's a holocaust. Because, you know, that's the holocaust number. Yes, uh, I was on the carpet before the managing uh, manager of the station the next day say, if you ever say that again, we'll fire you. Yeah. Now, that was my moment of, of, of discovery. My next moment of discovery was to see the way in which they dismember children alive in the womb. They snap their hands and their arms and their heads off while they are alive. Abortion is the most appalling crime against humanity. Uh, if you were to be a senior nurse in England with those numbers and you accepted the theological understanding of human beings who are, who are, who are called from before they're in the womb, Jeremiah tells us, surely you would have some responsibility to say or do something. But on this, um, Bishop Sarah Mullally has remained completely silent. She now occupies the third most senior bishopric in the country. She remains completely silent. It, it, it's so important. It matters too much. You, you well, cannot be silent. But, but Gavin, it, it's a personal choice. We don't want to invade the privacy of others. The sad thing is there's six million frickin' personal choices that you know end in in the death um you know it, i we could talk for days about abortion that's uh, certainly one of my hot topics uh, but, gavin but, but in this in this particular case the the, the problem mm -hmm. the the reason we're talking about it mm -hmm. is that the church has appointed a midwife mm -hmm. to a to a moral teaching position a midwife who presided over wholesale industrial abortion mm -hmm. right. this is not about this is not about sexism or gender this is the most appalling ethical stain upon the church of england and uh, and and needs to be said to her. and i'm sorry if she hadn't didn't have much time for theological or ethical education and I hope perhaps that that some of the anxiety about Christians may get to her and she may change her position mm -hmm. many of us have changed our positions I pray and I hope she can too
Um, well, let's cover gay marriage. Uh, obviously, you have a, a gay dean crisis going on over there. What would her position be on that? Has she stated so? Well, I was at a, a uh, so the answer is yes. She, she stated a, uh, as, as most of the women le leaders in the church have done, they have, mm. they've trodden the Welby line. And the Welby line is to give out two different signals at once, which is to say, of course, we believe in, in keeping the rules of the Church of England. But to tell you the truth, we're very, very concerned uh, about the pastoral care of LGBT people, people. And this will mean presiding over their relationships with blessings in some form or another. I was at a conference in Oxford and uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and a senior evangelical who came up to me, was retired, a layman, and said, you know, Gavin, we made the most terrible mistake. We don't really have a theology of priesthood and episcopacy as conservative evangelicals. We just do ministry. And when it came to the vote about women and bishops, we voted for it because we wanted to be nice and generous and we didn't think a lot hung on it and the whole thing about Paul and headship is you can put the scale anywhere you like uh, you know may maybe if there's a male archbishop every everything under that's okay and he said we've only just discovered that by voting for women to become bishops all the women who have become bishops and are moving to senior positions are in favor of gay marriage uh, they're probably in favor of abortion because none of them have spoken out against it and we therefore we made a terrible mistake um we did it without any theology <laughs> we did it out of out of generosity misplaced generosity and and so the difficulty is we now are finding a generation of senior very competent women who are uh, who are pro-gay marriage and pro-lgbt sarah mulally is one of them though she's uh, being very careful about what she says in public and and one of the appointments that was announced this week is is Vivian Fall who was Dean of York and and the reason that's interesting is that one of the arguments used as we as we were talking about the ordination of women was the church really needs women because men are bullies men are interested in power men don't know how to handle people with love and gentleness men provoke crises and we need some soft feminine touches. So when they appointed Vivian Fall as Dean of York, one of the first things she did was to silence the bells of York for the first time in about 800 years yeah, because, was... <laughs> <laughs> because people accused her of bullying the bell ringers over it was health and safety, but essentially she, she, she made the most terrible misjudgment, bullied them into silence. They all resigned. And this was an example of how women can bully just as much as men can. We are no better than each other. Uh, and now if a man had fouled up that much, because she got, she pulled in the Archbishop of York and he made a fool of himself too, God bless him, as he tried to defend her, the indefensible. If a, if a man in a senior position like that had shown such bad judgment, he would not be given another another position. But in this particular case, uh, it, it appears that the Vivian Falls be given a free pass and she's been made Bishop of Bristol. One of the things that she said on gay marriage was, the thing about gay marriage, I keep the rules, but I find ways of getting around them Aww, in order to bless. How Christian of her. Isn't this? Well, <laughs> and so, you know, we're back to what we said. We told you this would happen. We told you this was a plan. This is what they're doing. And does it matter if, if our reading of the Bible and our reading of the call of God and our reading of how to be faithful to Jesus is right? This matters very much because the church is becoming studiously, methodically, institutionally unfaithful. And, and, and God will not bless it because you have to be able to repent. And if you, if you won't repent because you say, well, I'm right and the Bible's wrong, um, it's a bad place for a church to be in. It is. All right. So now it's time for audience participation. You can play a part in this episode. You can like the episode. I thought you thought I knew what I was going to do here. Uh, you can comment on the episode. I, we're not getting a lot of comments, which obviously means Gavin, George, Alan, and myself are absolutely right about what we talk about. Nobody has a different opinion than us, and that's the way it should be. Uh, you could share the episodes uh, if you want to share. I've been seeing more and more of this, and I'm going to call out and uh, uh, compliment the people who do share because we can watch on Facebook who does and does not share. 
Um, and f the most important thing you can do is subscribe. Uh, this show comes out once, twice, three times a week. And if you want to get instant notification through Gmail or f uh, whatever email you have, you have to click the subscribe button. Boom. You know instantly when a new episode comes together. Gavin, thank you for the show. A lot of fun. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 395 of Anglican Unscripted. Only five to go to 400. That's going to be exciting. <laughs> we just hit our 3,000th subscriber, too. Big numbers. I can't believe it. Oh, that's great. Well, wow, thank God. Hooray. <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> well, well done, Kevin and George. <laughs> and Gavin. Gavin.